play our connect together video. So I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you for attending this Connect Together event. During this event, we have automatic closed captioning available. Please go to the bottom of the Zoom meeting, click Live Transcript, and then Show Subtitles to turn them on. Before we begin, we'd like to take a quick moment to let you know how you can join an opinion research panel made specifically for British Columbians living with disabilities. For 25 years, the Disability Foundation has been fostering meaningful experiences for Canadians with disabilities through outdoor recreation, social connectedness, innovative adaptive devices, and more. Today we are asking, how has the pandemic affected you? Help strengthen decision makers' understanding of your needs and experiences by joining an online opinion research panel consisting solely of people with disabilities and their caregivers. Make a difference in your community today. The Disability Foundation. Reimagine what is possible. Did you know? Young adults with disabilities have a harder time getting hired. Break down barriers by sharing your story. Take our survey. All right, and I'll bring it back to Amanda. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hello, so shall I start the, the show? Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, I will uh, share my screen. We did practice this, so uh, I just want to welcome everybody to uh, the container gardening for winter. Sorry, uh, we got a good day today, but I think with all this weather, people aren't really too keen on, uh, on gardening, but <laughs> anyway, all right. So, um, all right, so can everybody see that? Is everybody okay? I've got yes. this thing here, shall I get rid of this? I, I think I can, there we go, all right. Okay, so, um, um, I, I, I just wanted to start off that every winter, I, I do a, a, a lovely winter planter and every year I change it out. And uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. I know I, you know, since I don't have a, we're not there in person, I can't talk to you about uh, what you do. Um, so that's be glad when we, when we can all get together again and no more of these Zoom meetings. All right. Even though there's better than nothing, right? But it's nice to see everybody and talk to everybody. All right, so here we go. So uh, let's just, uh, I used to do, um, you may have heard of me before because I used to do uh, presentations, gotten presentations to Diga before. Um, and uh, I'm uh, with Amanda's Garden Consulting Company and I now have a new website. So if you wanna check out that and it has all the stuff that I'm talking about today plus more, uh, it's called thegardenwebsite.com. So if you want to do that, um, feel free to peruse my humongous site. It has lots of pictures in too. All right, so here we go. So this picture here actually I tell, should tell you I took in February in Victoria uh, on one of the many buildings there that have nice planters. So there's lots of nice things out there uh, if, you, if you really have an eye for it and look. So one of the issues with uh, container gardening here is the weather, of course. And we don't know what the weather's going to be like this time this year because uh, we've got El Nino uh, this year. So El Nino is supposed to bring us lots of rain, which also may bring a lot of snow. I don't know. It depends if we get uh, really cold temperatures. Well, enough to make the, the rain freeze. So we'll have to see. So prolonged uh, below freezing temperatures are not a good thing for the many of the plants that we have here in temperate British Columbia. We are in zone eight. So because we're in zone eight, that means that it's a uh, very fair weather uh, plants here. So the temperate plants that don't like it too cold and also in that other respect, they don't like it too hot. Um, so prolonged freezing temperatures like for uh, 
four weeks or something, that's a bit too long. Maybe even three weeks is too long. We've had it and our plants have suffered for it. And of course, plants in planters suffer more so than the ones in the ground because the ones in the ground have the thermal heat of the earth to keep them warm. The ones in planters don't. So we will be talking a bit about how to keep the, the roots a little warmer during the cold uh, snaps that we might have this year. Hopefully we won't, but you never know. So another thing that we have a problem with, and this, this occurs to all plants, whether in a planter or in, a, in the ground, is the fluctuating temperatures from day to night. Because in the daytime, it gets quite warm you know, the sun's out and then the uh, it gets quite cold at night. And especially if it's a clear night, if it's a clear night, it gets quite cold. And uh, that's one thing about when I was living in Alberta, we had a problem with the fluctuating temperatures from day to night. They were quite, uh, quite extreme. Uh, so you get above freezing temperatures during the day and then it would drop down to about 20 below at night, which of course doesn't do anything for the plants at all, whether they're in the ground or in a planter. So yes, we do have to worry about with the fluctuating temperatures even here, because sometimes if we have a, a cool night, a cold night where it's clear skies, yeah, we're going to get we're going to get some uh, heaving of the soil. So what happens is the soil in the plant and in the ground, uh, they uh, it expands during the day when it's hot or warmer anyway. And then in the evening, when it gets cool, the ground shrinks. So the soil expands during the day and then shrinks during the night. So that means that the roots are dislodged within the soil. Bulbs, especially daffodils, hate that. And what happens to them is that they tend to, tend to uh, break up and, and kind of like get un, uh, un, unseated so, so to speak. So in other words, they just totally kind of pop out of the ground. That's why it's difficult to grow bulbs in um, Alberta and other really northern communities where the temperature fluctuates. Flooding is another issue, not so much in other provinces, but here there's certainly an issue with flooding. Uh, and of course, we can see that with the weather we've had now. Uh, it's just we've got a nice day, of course, today. Um, but will it continue? Apparently not. So, yeah, so flooding. So we have to talk about flooding and we'll talk about what to do about that. And then also another issue is, is ice. Ice is a real issue because it breaks plants. It just, you know, whole stems can fall off because they're frozen, especially if the wind starts up or if somebody knocks, knocks them, then they just break. And then uh, wind, of course. Wind is an issue because, and I know a lot of people don't think much about wind, but wind actually is very drying and that's what causes a lot of wind to kill. So with a lot of wind, you'll have it sucking the moisture out of the foliage. And with that, you get, you get death, winter kill and uh, certainly damage. So it's a good idea not to put your planters where they're going to get a lot of wind, like between two buildings, for example, that kind of thing, and out in the yard. All right. Now, another thing is here, you see all the snow, and I haven't got so, so snow, even though it looks terrible when it happens, snow actually is a pretty good insulator. It actually keeps plants warm because it's it's, it's a nice puffy layer of insulation. Uh, well, the problem is with snow is, is that it gets heavy and uh, it breaks branches and distorts nice round uh, shapes of, of, of uh, round cedars and that kind of thing and, and, um, and even of uh, boxwood. So yeah, that's an issue, <coughs> excuse me. Other than that, uh, snow is not really a big deal. So hardiness. So, uh, sorry, I had to have a drink. Um, so you got to select hardy plants. So we are, as I said, zone eight in the lower mainland. Uh, so because they're in pots, we have to go a zone less or more. So select plants that are zone seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. 
And as I said to you before, don't kind of put them in a spot where they're going to be uh, exposed to a lot of the elements, you know, tuck them in beside the house, you know, by the front door. Uh, most of the time, winter planters are by the front door, so in, in, they're in a pretty well protected area. Now, if you're, oh, like this is my mother's balcony here. Um, and so we put all the planters together to protect them so they're all together. But these are not ones that we're going to be looking at during the, the winter. These are the ones that are going to be showing their stuff in the spring. So it's all right to put them to one side. But if you really want a plant at the front door or the back door or wherever, then it's a good idea to um, have um, a hardy plant that don't need to be protected during the winter, right? So go, go with a few zones less. Now, if you're high up in a building, like on the top, like 10th floor or something, you'll have to really select plants that are much uh, hardier than zone seven. You may have to go to zone six and five due to the fact that it's much colder up higher up in the building. So uh, think about that when you select plants, if you're going to go out to the nursery and get plants. And the, the nursery is a good place to go. And get, go to a nursery that they know what they're doing and you can ask people and they will help you because that's what they're there for. Okay, so one of the, uh, one of the issues that we have, oh, sorry, here, I touched the wrong thing here. One of the things here we have, because of all the rain, and even without rain, we need to um, make sure that uh, the rain can dissipate. So the rain can drain away. So if the, uh, so you have to have drainage holes in pots. So a lot of people think that, you know, you don't need drainage holes in pots, but you actually do with all kinds of pots, with all kinds of plants, you need drainage holes. The only time you don't need drainage holes is if you're like growing something like a water lily or something like that. So don't cover the holes because if you cover the holes, you're going to um, defeat the purpose of them being there. You want drainage. You don't want to, the soil will not leak out of the holes. Uh, soil actually, uh, kind of clings together that's what soil does because <laughs> the only thing that doesn't cling together is sand so so make sure that you uh, have drainage holes because uh, it's wet out there so and uh, don't put rocks or gravel in the bottom of the pot that does not increase drainage it actually impairs drainage they've done many studies of it uh, about how rocks and any other thing at the bottom of the pot actually um, impairs drainage. And if you don't believe me, go online and you'll find all kinds of things about why you should not add rocks or gravel to the bottom of the pot. It's uh, an outdated uh, thinking there. So we've uh, come a long way since then. So drainage trays. Now drainage trays we use during the summer because uh, you want to keep your patio and your deck clean of uh, water that's spilled coming through the drainage holes of your pot. So you wanna make sure that you have a nice drainage tray underneath it to collect the water. And that will also help you help the plants uh, absorb more moisture, especially in the heat of the summer. But this time of the year, you don't want drainage trays underneath your pot. So I usually like to invert them and just put the pot on top. So I, I up in the drainage tray and just put the, uh, either move them or or I put the pot back on top of it so it doesn't collect the water. So, uh, and that seems to work well. I've got a few that I have yet to do in my garden yet, so I've got to get out there. So self-watering pots, a lot of people use those and they're great for when it's hot and sunny, but with our, our rainy, rainy weather, it's probably not a good idea, unless of course it's not in where it's going to get rain if it's going to get rain then probably a self-watering pot is not a good idea but if it's uh actually uh under the eaves or in a protected area where it will not get rain then definitely make sure that you um uh use a watering pot if you've got one um all right let's see and uh pot size so you can't have little bitty plants for the winter because the more soil around the roots the hardier it is. A uh, little tiny pot, it means that there's not much protection for those roots. So get, get a, a large pot about 16 inches diameter, 
diameter minimum um, and then you'll it will be able to overwinter better um, okay and pot feet is uh, another thing that um, I use and they've got some really cute ones on the market um, I've got I've got the ones on the lower right they're they're cute and uh, I like the frog ones I'd love those but those are not mine so anyway these keep the plant pot off the ground this helps prevent a mess all over your deck and staining and mold underneath it. And then also it stops the uh, slugs from coming up there and uh, devouring your plants. And also looks a little nicer, I think, you know, it gives it more of a nicer presentation. And then uh, plant dollies. I thought I'd put this in because it's, they're handy to have. So you can move your planters wherever you want um it's it's a kind of a handy thing to have um, um i've even seen them at the dollar stores and stuff especially for big huge planters it's nice to have something steady to move them around in um, because sometimes you do if you follow the sun or whatever or just rearrange the planters outside on the deck so i thought i'd talk about the types of pots because some pots are better than others to overwinter your plants. So terracotta and clay, uh, well, the biggest thing with them is that uh, even though they're fairly inexpensive, uh, they crack. Yeah, they, they're, they're very fragile. Um, but one thing about them is that uh, they're quite porous. So that helps the roots gain air. So you tend to not have waterlogging as much. You don't have saturated, soggy roots as much. Um, also, they're very stable as well. You know, they're heavy. So um, it's great on a windy location, you know, where there is wind, you know, or if it's, if it's a plant that's top heavy. Sometimes we've got plants that are top heavy, so that helps keep it stable. So, yeah, you do get frost cracks and also... Uh, get salt on the rim, as you can tell in the lower right hand uh, picture. Um, and uh, you just have to clean them off as, as best you can. I usually use a scrubbing tool to scrub it off um, before planting. And also before planting with a clay pot, you sp you're supposed to soak it. The reason why is because it, it absorbs all the moisture away from the roots. So the plant may be thirsty, even though you've just watered it. Uh, yes, yeah, store the uh, pots upside down, uh, preferably indoors so they don't crack. And uh, the clay soil is actually pretty good for um, insulating the roots. It does have some protection for root insulation. It's, it's not perfect, but it's certainly better than others. So there is some protection. And of course, the thicker the, the clay, the better. So I thought also I'd, I'd tell you this because sometimes, you know, it's nice to have um, some nice old clay pots that look like they've been around for eons. Um, one thing you need to do though, if you want to use a, a clay pot is uh, use a liquid sealer inside the pot that you can get at craft stores and even at um, probably uh, garden stores too. Uh, and if you want to make them look old and, and funky, then just mix up some buttermilk and yogurt uh, and, and with some live moss. Lord knows we have enough outside in our gardens with some live moss and just blend it together in a blender and then paint it on the pots and then put the pots outside and they'll get all funky for you. And even if you don't want to do it now, you can do it come spring. All right. And... Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I should I should use the, the other things. This one's my mouse is too happy here. It's a very loose mouse. OK, so uh, ceramic stoneware. Um, this is heavy stuff. Yeah, I know at London Drugs, they sell those little round blue ones all the time, which are lovely. But boy, they're heavy. So glazed clay. Uh, they've actually put a glaze on it, glaze, glaze on it. And um, because of that, you don't have the pores that you have on the regular untreated clay pots. So you won't get as uh, much air exchange and moisture loss and moisture retention through the moisture loss through the glazed clay. Um, 
they um, are still prone to cracking. Um, they're heavy, as you know, um, and they have good water retention. But uh, they do provide some protection for the plants, for the roots. Plastic. Okay, through the winter, plastic is not really the best idea, even though they're very handy to have, and you can pick some up at the dollar store, and some of them are quite nice at the dollar store. However, um, they're just not good for bad weather. They just, they crack, they disintegrate, they shatter. Um, however, they're nice lightweight and they're inexpensive. Um, <laughs> so, so they're kind of handy in that. And they come in all different colors and all designs and stuff. So they're really nice to have. However, they don't last, their longevity is short. And uh, they're good for, oh, I spelled moisture wrong. Um, moisture loving plants like it because of course there's no air exchange, water exchange at all. The only drainage that they get is through the holes of the bottom of the pot. Um, all the more reason not to cover them up. And um, one thing about black plastic, I, and I thought I'd mention this in, in the summer, especially if it's in a hot location, the roots kind of heat up too much. I've seen that happen with uh, plants, they get too hot in black plastic pots. So uh, yes, try not to, uh, try and avoid that in the summertime at least. And then the fiberglass and resin. Uh, so this is one of my pots. I've used this for eons. Um, I think I brought it up when I moved from Florida. It's lasted forever. It's a great pot. It's, it's a blend of resin and glass fibers um, and it's very lightweight. And it, it looks really good, even though it's, uh, <laughs> it looks like it's uh, a clay pot and, and it isn't or a stone pot. Uh, lightweight, durable, definitely. Uh, it's got good root insulation because it's got all the glass fibers and resin in there. It's very durable and it isn't prone to cracking. And I said, I've had this, this plant specifically for many, many years and it's still looking pretty good. In fact, the more beat up it gets, the nicer I like it, so. All right, wood. So if you're gonna get wood, uh, don't use pressure treated wood, um, especially if you're dealing with food. If you're making it, if you're making a planter with pressure treated wood, make sure that you are using a face mask because you shouldn't inhale that. Um, uh, for uh, if you want a wooden plant that you don't have to treat, then just use cedar, teak, or redwood. They're both, they're all three of them are very hardy. Um, and you could also stain the wood too, and which is uh, what this person's done with this planter. So yeah, they're uh, they are pretty good actually. Uh, they're not too bad. They don't have longevity. Eventually, they do kind of rot. Um, yeah, do keep them off the ground. This is where you want to put them on a on one of those uh, stands or have uh, the pot feet or the wheelies. And um, they will rot eventually over time and just disintegrate. I've seen that even with some really ones, really uh, old, thick cedar ones, eventually they do kind of break down. And a lot of times it's where the fasteners go, where it's all connected together. That's usually where it first goes. And uh, it's a good idea to line them with plastic. That's just to keep them, keep the moisture from the roots going into the wood. Just gives them a little, little bit more longevity. Um, yeah, once they're, once it's, they're wet, they're, they're hard to dry out. They become quite, quite sodden because they are porous, of course, because it's wood. Um, and you must remember to add drainage holes with them if you're, if you're going to use a wooden planter. Uh, good water retention. And I think that, yeah, it's a slow to crack in cold weather, unlike plastic, which is very prone. And also with the clay, uh, they, they, they're much more resilient to, um, to the temperature fluctuations compared to the clay and to the stoneware and the plastic. Metal, I'm not a big keen lover of metal pots. I, it seems like it's like a little brutal, <laughs> you know, because there's no insulation value whatsoever. And, it's, um, and, and I've seen some that they just kind of like become oxide, they get white on the outside, from the oxide. And um, they don't rust though, the al aluminium doesn't rust. Um, you can use heavy, heavy iron ones. I've seen those, especially in those 
um, old garden stores where they have all these old things that they've brought over from Europe. Those are gorgeous, they're very expensive, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, those are very nice, but uh, hard to move, hard to move around. Uh, they are durable. If you're gonna get metal, I think I'd probably want to put something inside of it first, just to make it a little bit hardier. You know, just a little bit warmer in there because I, I think of them freezing their little roots off in the winter. <laughs> okay, uh, concrete. Of course, it's heavy, but boy, is it ever stable. And if you don't want anybody to steal your planter, have a concrete one because they're really hard to steal. Um, um, let's see, they have some insulating value um depending on the thickness of course um uh, and if it's not good concrete they will crack because there's there's differences in concrete which i'm sure you you've seen over the over the years you know look, look at the concrete uh, stats um and pathways they break driveways they break and then others stay forever you know it doesn't matter what you do to them um yeah, they have a, a little insulating value. Uh, one of the big things, especially if it's new concrete, if it's a new concrete planter, they will actually leach alkaline properties into the soil, turning the soil that's very acidic into alkaline. So it's all right if, that, if that's okay for the plant, but most plants don't like that. So be mindful of that. And if you do have a new concrete uh, planter, uh, maybe leave it out in the garden for a couple of years before you plant. <laughs> That's uh, all my recommendations for concrete. All right. Does anybody have any questions? You were all all right there. I know you got everybody uh, totally silent there. I'm going to put this on there. Um, I can't hear anybody. <laughs> Here. Oh, okay. Nobody? Okay. All right. Oh, well, we'll do the questions afterwards. All right. Because we'll have a question period afterwards. So let me go back. Let me just go back here. Okay. And I will get back to this here. Okay. All right. So uh, soil and planting. So uh, these are metal planters right here. Very swan, yay. I got this from online, though. I don't know this person at all. So anyway, soil and planting. So general soil mix. Because these are for winter, You'll have to have good drainage and then also because there'll be like perennial plants because there's not many annual plants we can put in over the winter uh, these two these plants are going to be living in that planter for some time for more than a year so you want to put in some compost and there's all different kinds you know the more compost you want i put this general thing in but the more compost you have the better okay and uh use a plant mix not just a regular soil mix, but a plant mix. So they're a little better, they're a little bit more substantial than a regular potting soil. Now be careful when you're buying the potting soil too, because some actually have um, uh, a gel in that actually uh, holds moisture in. You don't want those for a winter planter. That's okay for something that you're going to plant in summer. For a winter planter, you don't want something that's going to absorb water. You want something that's actually going to have good drainage. And this is another reason why you want to put vermiculite in. Now, you can put in sand, but sand, you have to mix it in well. And then also, it's heavy. <coughs> sand is very heavy, but vermiculite isn't. And is, vermiculite is easy to use. So uh, I like to use vermiculite. You can use perlite, uh, but perlite tends to raise, come to the top of the surface of the soil. So I'm a big fan of vermiculite. You can also put coir in there too. Coir is from coconuts. And that also helps with the uh, drainage. Um, so also you want to put in some bone meal. Uh, the bone meal is uh, helps with the roots. It's high in uh, the middle number, which is phosphorus. And then also a starter fertilizer and the slow release starter fertilizer is good. And so that's also high in the middle number. You don't want to put a high nitrogen fertilizer in because you don't want them to start lots of new growth. You want them to start root growth, not um, leafy growth. 
leafy growth is this is not the time of the year for leafy growth this is the time for the roots to get established before the winter comes right and mix everything thoroughly mix it quite well with your hands and then moisten it and the reason why you moisten you don't want to put plants in 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 dry soil because that dry soil will suck the moisture away from the roots so um moisten the soil so it should be like like a, a damp sponge and then top dress annually and the reason why i said top dress annually that means just putting some compost on the top of the soil every year of that planter this is good for your trees and your shrubs and your perennials and it just gives them a little bit of more food right so that's what compost is right it's food for the plant so this is an easy way of gathering food for the plants and giving them a little top up they like that okay so uh here's my planter again and and uh um so use the soil uh, put and it should be as i said moist uh, slightly moist and then fill the plant up with three quarters of soil and then firm it slightly with your hands and then arrange the potted plants on top the way you think you like them. Um, and when you uh, uh, decide to plant them, loosen the roots first. So take them out of the pot. Once you put them in their nice arrangement, I've got more pictures on this, don't worry. So once you've got them in their little arrangement that you like, then loosen the roots and then plant them. Burn them into the soil. People are most too gentle with the roots. You want to make sure there's firm contact between the roots and the soil. And, uh, and then add more soil in around the plant so they're all together and that there's no air spaces because air space will kill the plants for sure. And you want to make sure that all that soil is firm in there so it doesn't settle in between the plants and then the plants are sticking out, okay? And then you need a little space from the top of the soil to the rim of the pot so you can add water and, um, and other things, um, water gently, but thoroughly. So here we go here. So here's me putting here, I think I've got a, a marker here. Uh, uh, okay, I'll use a pen here. So here, the, so here is the, um, the um, plants that I've put in here. It's a, this is a, um, heavenly bamboo and some uh, primroses. And then here is uh, some uh, other plants from another time uh, in spring. So another thing is you can always throw in some uh, spring flowering bulbs come spring if you didn't plant any in the fall. <laughs> That's a nice cheat there. So one thing you should do is before you get cracking is you should water the plants beforehand, especially if they're dry. Many plants, when you get them from the shops, they're just a little bit too dry because they're all root bound. And then moisten the soil too, as I said, because you can't have dry soil. Then add more soil, place the plants, loosen the roots, keep the roots intact. Don't loosen the roots so it's all like falling apart. And, uh, and then I said, and uh, water gently thoroughly and then place them in a protected place so they're not going to get uh, too much sun um, because if, if they get too much sun, um, and elements and wind and all that, they're not going to like that. This, they need to be a little babied because they're new and they're a new home, right? And uh, here's another one that I've got cracky here. So this one uh, here, I've got this uh, cypress there, which is very tender. I'm not recommending that now. And then uh, these other plants, I've got recommendations in there. And, you know, just placing them on top of the soil just to see if you like the arrangement. And here... On this bottom one here, I've got uh, I got some um, tulips that I put in there as well, and then here's some kale, and this is the lemon cypress and uh, dusty miller here, and then here are some uh, mums, and here's another one here, and I've also I've added some some gourds and stuff. It's always nice to have this. So I, as you can see, it's the same plant, but I've changed out year after year. And I've got this uh, Cotone Aster at the bottom draping all over the place. And uh, I cut that back and it flowers and have the red berries. So it's nice. All right. And then don't forget to put your spring flowering bulbs in. So the crocus, they're early. Put lots in there. They're, they're inexpensive. They're fun to have and you can find them everywhere. And, uh, and then here, this is actually a planter from... Uh, 
uh, Queen Elizabeth Gardens, and they've done lovely plants, this big concrete planter that is permanent there, and they've mixed it in with some forget-me-nots, which is rather nice. So they've got orange and yellow uh, with a nice contrast of uh, forget-me-nots in the planter. Feel free to put those in. You know, you go to the stores, they've got them there now already. So, uh, and uh, they should still be having the full stock in there. One of the earliest flowering bulbs, of course, is snowdrops and everybody waits for those to come in January, February. It's always such, oh my God, spring is on its way. So it's always nice to see those pop up and they're so dainty and pretty. And then here is uh, a plant that I, I did myself um, just with some pansies from the shops. And this is how I planted it the year before this is so I put the soil in and I uh, some soil in then I put the uh, bulbs in of the uh, muscari uh, the grape hyacinths and and then that um, that powdery stuff on there is cinnamon and I like to put cinnamon on my bulbs as well as bone meal bone meal and cinnamon and uh, the cinnamon actually do think it helps with the um, with the fungus and also keeping away uh, rodents that like to eat them. They don't. I guess they don't like cinnamon. And so uh, I use this every year with the uh, bone meal and the cinnamon, and it works really well. And as you can see, the result was this top planter here, this one here. That was the same thing. And then what I did is I put soil over top. So I put soil over top of the of the bulbs, and then I planted the pansies. And then here's another one of mine uh, creations. I, you know, I put little ornaments in there. I got this this little thing from the dollar store, cute. And then these here are curly twigs from uh, my next door neighbor's um, uh, curly. Uh, uh, what is it called? The uh, Harry Lauder's walking stick, also called a curly hazel, hazelnut there. And uh, so mix in your, your bulbs and your, so when you're planting your, your perennials, throw in some bulbs before you do that. And if you've, if you've already got some, just make a hole with a screwdriver or something uh, or a, a long narrow um, towel and just put the, make space in between the plants and put the bulbs in if you have already planted them. Because I've done that too, and it still works. And here's another one. And so this is this is black mondo grass here. This black, <laughs> crazy little thing there. It's but it's lovely. And uh, and this is uh, you should see this. But I should actually show you pictures of this now. It's doing really well. And this is uh, uh, Hakura a coral bells. I think it's what's called lime something or other. And then here's some primroses. And then here's some uh, narcissus. And actually this didn't have the, I didn't plant the nice narcissus in it, but it comes spring, it was kind of bare because uh, this primrose didn't do as well. So I just went to the shops and picked, I think I was in the grocery store and picked up a pot of uh, narcissus, some daffodils and threw that in and voila, so um So aftercare, so putting in a, a, a nice protected location, as I said, um, and then, and then you can move it somewhere more permanent um, after about a few days, you know. Um, if it's under the eaves, you've got to water when necessary. Don't forget to water because just because of the eaves, it's not going to get any water at all. So it will dry out. So you do have to be um, wary of that. And, uh, and yeah, keep it away from downspouts and dripping eaves. Uh, um okay so design uh so the thrill fill and spill we'll do that i'm sure you've uh, know the thrill fill and spill so the thrill is this here and this is the fill and then this is the spill that's how we do it <laughs> all right and you can see this in this and then this this one here um this is a um I think it's at a grocery store I found this. And um, you got the uh, mums there and the ornamental kale and the uh, heather and the uh, coral bells. And oh, look at English ivy there. I'm not sure what this type of grass is. 
anyway, see, and it's it's a nice it's a nice shape. Notice that the the plant pots aren't really small um, for all those things there, but they are still really cramped. And this is another one that's a nursery, and this is also uh, coral bells here, and this is uh, bugleweed, and this is uh, this here is uh, creeping jenny. So this is the bugleweed here. And then here, I think this is Miscanthus grass. Um, yeah, and the coral bells here. So yeah, it's just a simple thing. But do do fill them, you know, like don't be too sparse. Make them look good now. Don't expect them to look better later. Um, make them look good now. So fill them up, put lots of plants in. Uh, winter protection. Uh, so this is one of mine and I just got the foliage from the neighborhood and put it on top and you know look pretty good too you know um because this is a tender plant and it, it it looked really good and it did it did work so i was very pleased again here's with the snow don't worry too much about the snow as i said uh see this mum is still dropping despite the snow this was i think last november when we got that snow all of a sudden we were all unprepared uh more now so for this winter protection, this is for the plants that you're not showing off, that you're not keeping uh, by the front door and, and uh, welcoming people. This is, I just thought I'd throw this in because I think, you know, if you have other planters, you probably, probably need to know how to protect them. So this is a Portuguese laurel in a pot, the pot that's too small for it, but I sold it the year after because uh, I, I don't have any space for a Portugal laurel. Uh, I found it as a weed in the garden. And the next thing you know, it, it was growing to beat the band. And so I wanted to save it because it was, you know, if you're that sturdy, I, you need a home. So anyway, so I put bubble wrap around it, I wrap lots of bubble wrap around the pot. And the reason why I want to put bubble wrap around the pot is because that's where the roots are. A lot of people take the top, but you actually need to protect the bottom as well because that is where the roots are, then being all nice and warm. And then also put straw on that uh, on top of the soil. And if I didn't have straw, I could have used fall leaves. And then, uh, and, and that, this uh, Portuguese uh, laurel is pretty hardy. So I probably wouldn't have put the top on unless I was living in somewhere else in Canada. But the one on the right there, this, this guy here, I did actually, um, put the burlap around there and and tied it up there just to protect the plant um i think it's the same one i i just wanted to show you as a uh how to do it if you're going to do it make sure that the burlap goes right down past the top of the rib of the pot because you don't want cold air going up uh between the pot and the um on the plant and then seal it off Notice I'm not using plastic at the top of the plant because if I do that, for one thing, plastic has no insulating value at all. And also you'll get rot. Um, the air tends to just sit there and rot. And uh, so it's not a good idea to use plastic on top of the pot, but, do, but you can use bubble wrap. You can also use fiberglass on here or wrapped in plastic. And uh, also there's, and if you want to do the top here, there's also, um, Frost blankets you can put on, you can put a sheet or an old sheet or a tablecloth, and that also works. And then also to protect your plants throughout the winter here, you see I've got a nice rose that my girlfriend gave to me, and I want to save that because it's moved away. So it's very important to me. So I want to make sure it's all right. So I've dug a trench and then put the plants in the trench and then put straw in around them and then over top of them. Uh, so plant selection. So again, here's my planter by my front door. And um, so collect, select plants that are zoned seven or less. Uh, you can get cold hardy annuals, we've got a few, and then evergreen perennials, because of course they're evergreen, you'll see them all year long. And then broadleaf evergreens, uh, again, they will stay green for you all year long. And then small trees and dwarf varieties, there's many out there. And, uh, and then also know the conditions where you're going to be planting, put placing the planter. Is it sunny? Is it shady? Uh, does it get sun in the morning, sun in the afternoon, that kind of thing. So pansies, of course, they're, they're lovely and they're, they're uh, available. 
uh, this time of year, if you go to nurseries, uh, ornamental kale, I think we've got there. There's the ornamental kale, which are also lovely. And, um, and uh, there are also many, many different types. Same with the pansies, many, many kinds. And then the dusty miller, which is an annual, is a hardy annual. It's pretty tough. It lasts a few years. And then perennials, this is black mondo uh, grass right here, like I had in that one plant. It's nice to have this black mondo grass with things that are brightly colored, like uh, chartreuse colored, like that uh, uh, lime green um, coral bells. And then look at the coral bells. Yeah, there's all different kinds of coral bells. And another thing too, is that the nursery, both those are coral bells at the bottom, uh, the, the nurseries, uh, have these on sale now and they want to get rid of them because they don't want to keep them over winter so now's a good time to go to the nursery and uh, so here's some more succulents some succulents which are kind of nice so sedum and hens and chicks and you can uh, all different kinds of sedum all kinds of hens and chicks you can go out and uh, they're hardy now not a lot of the succulents are so you have to make sure that if you when you're buying succulents to look at the zones that they're in. Um, so read the labels. The label will tell you what zone. And if they don't, then you ask. And off, actually, usually if they don't have a zone on there, that means that they are uh, for inside and not for planting outside in the garden. And of course, something like this with these hens and chicks and the sedum, they need it a uh, sunny location with really good drainage or else they'll rot. Uh, Lenten roses, hellebore, um, they last forever. They're, they're even well into spring. They'll, they'll start flowering in the winter, depending on which ones you get. And uh, you can have flowers all through until uh, spring. So they're a wonderful thing. And, uh, and such pretty flowers. And then the carex, it's, it's an ornamental grass. Um, and it's it's tough. It's uh, it's hard to kill carex. <laughs> and I like the Everglow gold here with the the stripes. It's a lovely it's a lovely plant and uh, tough tough as all nails. And then primroses, of course, many many kinds of primroses. And uh, and then Virginia, which flower in early early spring um, with these pink flowers. And they're coming out with more and more different kinds of Virginias. So, and they've got that leathery leaf and, um, and they always look pretty good. They like, uh, these are both like partial shade. Um, and also the uh, Virginia likes more shade than the primrose. A primrose can have more sun, but the Virginia, yeah. If you give Virginia too much sun, it gets, the leaves turn red. Uh, okay, shrubs. So get the dwarf ones. Now, when you go shopping for some evergreen shrubs to put in planters, do read the labels. Um, make sure that you're not just picking for height, you've got to pick for width, because some of them get quite wide. Uh, so be prepared for that. You don't, uh, you've got to read those labels and keep the labels too. Don't throw the labels out. I like to take pictures of my labels and put them on my hard drive on my computer. I used to save the little things, but you know, then they, I have this boxes and boxes of labels, which is like it's easier to put them on the hard drive. Um, and then, so here is the uh, dwarf, dwarf mugo pine here. This is the dwarf mugo pine, not the regular mugo pine, the dwarf, this is pumelo. Sorry, that's my phone, pumelo. And uh, then also this dwarf boxwood, uh, this is wolf boxwood, and there's all different kinds of boxwoods, so make sure you read the label. And then this is uh, uh, Blue Star Juniper. This is a wonderful little thing. It's got this gray, gray color, and it likes it hot and dry. Uh, and then the uh, sweet box. And the sweet box, they, one thing with the sweet box is that they have these flowers in late winter, February around there and they are fragrant. Those flowers are very fragrant. And then they also offer the uh, berries too, the blackberries. So they're a very nice plant, the sweet box. Especially if you want fragrance in the middle of the winter. More evergreen shrubs. 
heavenly bamboo on the left, uh, beautiful red berries. Um, and uh, it is not a bamboo. It is, uh, it's just called bamboo because it's a common name, but it doesn't mean that it's a bamboo. It does not spread like bamboo. It stays like that. And it turns a nice fall color too. So this will give you, this is more of your uh, thrill. If you're looking for a thrill in your planter, this is your thrill because it's upright, rather lacy, delicate. And then it has these clusters of these gorgeous berries. Um, so it's a, it's a hit, that one. And also it likes sun, by the way. And uh, then the, um, the Melford U. So this is a, there's other U's as well, but there's, a, you can get U's that are, that uh, the faster get U's, but this one's a very narrow U because some of the U's, even though they're narrow, they still get too big for a planter. So again, read your labels. And, um, and it likes shade, it likes shade and sun. It's very easy, you don't have to prune it, you don't have to cut it, it stays that shape, that's the way it grows. Very narrow and upright, it's a nice vertical accent. This also will be your, be your thrill in your planter. And then here for your spill is heathers, winter heathers, you know, come in all colors, they're lovely, except for yellow, we don't have yellow or orange but they're lovely pink and all colors. So another one for uh, evergreen shrubs is the sky pencil uh, Japanese holly and also the fastigat Japanese holly. And they, they, this is what I have in my garden here. And uh, look how um, they got the, the blueberries, the little flowers. And even though it's a holly, it does not have prickly leaves. It's got these nice soft leaves there, not prickly and it grows nice and vertical. And this could be your thrill. And uh, it likes sun and it likes shade. So it's a really easy peasy plant. And I love these things. I've got a few in my garden and I recommend, recommend them for my clients, for my business, so. And then for trailers, if you want some spill, then uh, Rock Spray Cotoneasta is, uh, it's got this herringbone uh, pattern for its uh, stems. And, uh, and then it's got these little, pretty little uh, flowers and uh, they're followed by the berries and then the leaves fall off and then you're still kept with the berries. So it's a nice plant. It's a very nice plant and it likes the sun and shade. And uh, Kinnikinnik, uh, Kinnikinnik is one of our native indigenous plants, Arctostaphylus uva ursi. And uh, this uh, picture was taken at Queen Elizabeth Gardens in their parking lot with the big, huge planters, and they're full of the kinnikinnik, and there's the little flowers, and they're followed by berries. So it's a nice, it's a nice plant, and it likes it hot and sunny, and dry. And then creeping jenny, I love the creeping jenny, especially with blue. I think they're lovely. So they're a golden color, and uh, they droop along uh, the edge of the pot. And uh, yes, they're a nice contrast to anything that uh, you have that's uh, your thrill or your fill. So yeah, they're a nice plant. And I like the uh, gold type, there's a green type, but the gold one is the most common and you can find that in practically every store. Now, the only thing is if it touches the ground, it will start to root. So be careful about that, <laughs> Let that happen. I meant some more trailers here. So English ivy. Yes, I know English ivy, you've got to be careful with it. Don't let it get the ground and grow up trees because it will, it will grow up the trees and, and smother them. Um, but they're nice to have because they do actually um, survive our winters beautifully and our summers. They really are a good plant for here. And then also beacon silver dead nettle. Now both these plants are considered invasive. So, um, so don't plant them in your, in your garden but keep them planters, they're nice. And then trees, got the dwarf varieties, dwarf varieties, always look for the dwarf varieties for planters. Yeah, and you can certainly use uh, uh, dwarf apples and that kind of thing. And I put these in, even though these are not evergreen, they have good structure. They've got good bones. They've got nice, strong um, silhouette. So even in a planter without any foliage on, they're still very attractive. So um, the Japanese maples, you can't go wrong with them. And then also the yucca, uh, 
and uh, this is a variegated yucca. This is like hot and dry. And then also the, the uh, dwarf Alberta spruce. It gets to be 12 feet uh, tall when it's mature, but it takes a long time to grow to that. And they're just perfect little Christmas trees. Don't let them dry too out, out too much because they'll tend to get spider mites. And then topiaries, of course, topiaries are wonderful. They're nice, uh, nice to have, and and uh, you, they're just high maintenance. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. You've got to keep uh, keep on it to make the shapes look nice all year long. And uh, and then don't forget, Christmas is coming up, and any season, even if it's a uh, um, uh, a birthday or whatever, you can always use your planters to stick in some some artificial berries or some stick sticks just to make it more festive. And I like doing that with mine and uh, and it works. And I um, I actually go to the dollar store and get a lot of stuff to put in my planters and it looks nice. And even get some uh, um, evergreen boughs from your other plants and just stick them in the soil. That's all you have to do. And uh, you don't even have to um, add any plants. You just need to stick some um, evergreen branches in and you're done all right and here i i'm done so is there anybody anybody got questions can anybody hear me <laughs> anybody there okay i'm gonna leave you now i'm gonna thank you so much okay. thanks there we go <laughs> have a wonderful weekend okay bye bye okay there we go all right thanks Okay, good. All right. So is there any questions? Did I do a full hour? Yes, I did. Oh, right on the money. That's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> good job, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. Okay. All right. Is there anybody got any questions? No? I think it's good. I think you did a good job explaining. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, if you need me for anything, uh, give me a call. Uh, just uh, Amanda's Garden Consulting and also go up to my website, uh, thegardenwebsite.com. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that you'll find something interesting there for yourself in gardening. Okay. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Okay. And thank you for coming. Thank, thank you so you. much.